John, you and I have known each other for a number of years, and I've had the opportunity to have a number of conversations with you and your unique and wonderful wife, Donna. That she this, is. This conversation is devoted to your career thus far as an award-winning writer, director, and producer. Let's start at the beginning. Where were you born, and where did you grow up? I was born in New Rochelle, New York, Queen City of the Sound, um, across from Long Island, uh, settled by the Huguenots, and uh, George M. Cohan lived there, so he wrote a song for one of his Broadway musicals called It's a Grand Old Town. It was at a time when, when we had a beautiful high school with arts and music. We had 1,500 people in our senior high. We had a full-time, on the faculty, full-time director, theater director, full-time technical director, and a part-time assistant director. We did four plays and a musical every year and countless one-act plays. There was marvelous participation by so many of the students, and it was a great, great experience um, for me, both sure. working backstage and on, ca uh, not on camera, but on the stage. So it was a way for me to get out of myself and it was wonderful. The other thing that happened at that time, our high school was given the opportunity to do a once a, it was probably once a month, um, teen club show on the local radio station. It was a very local radio station, but still. So um, I was selected because I was a writer and um, I picked the hottest girl uh, at the school, Carol Zeidler, and I was the one to write it, so that's how I got to be on it. So I got my first taste of, of doing stuff like that, writing and sort of performing. Enough I decided that um, that, that was not a career for me, but it was, it was a learning experience. And then when you graduated, you went on to college. My great aunt was going to put me through college. I got accepted to Dartmouth. So I started as pre-med. Uh, the first year I got involved with the Dartmouth Players, the Dartmouth Radio Station, the Dartmouth Film Society. And after my freshman year, I decided I really didn't want to be a doctor. I really wanted to do something else. So I got cut off. And all of a sudden, I had no funding. And there I was, stranded. And my uncle, thank God, came to the rescue. He convinced them to keep me there, give me jobs, give me a partial scholarship and funding, uh, student loans. And I changed careers, and I became an English drama major. And I got, as I said, I got very involved with the Dartmouth Players, the radio station. I wrote film notes for the Dartmouth Film Society. And I decided this is what I wanted to do. And Lee Hatz was trying to get the kids back into wearing hats. This was an era where nobody's wearing hats anymore. So they came up with a radio commercial writing contest. And I remember sitting at one of our film screenings with my little Corona typewriters and writing a commercial, which I submitted. And I got one of the runner-up prizes. And the big prize was not only a Lee hat, but a day at, at, the, at Gray Advertising. The second day was at CBS Television. And they were doing, I remember Mama on one stage and Omnibus on the other. And I looked, and everything was brand new. The cameras were brand new. It was like the technology. It was like state of the art. It was the future. And I said, this is everything I really like. It's radio, it's television, it's theater all in one. And I wanted to be in television. So that was rather a pivotal moment. Big moment. moment. Big moment. So once you graduated, what happened then? Well, uh, at the time, Pat Weaver, Sylvester L. Pat Weaver, was the head of NBC. And he was a Dartmouth graduate. And um, it was a, a, a new tradition, as long as he was there, that one student, one graduate from Dartmouth, would be accepted into the NBC management training program. I was that student at the time. I was the only one that applied, and I got it. So I said, great, I'm going to go to NBC. So I went for my interview, and everything was fine until they came to one very unfortunate question. They said, what is your draft status? Now, this was between the Korean and Vietnamese War. We were at peace, but we're still being drafted. So uh, I said, I don't know. And they said, we'll find out, because we have an 18-month program, and you can't, it can't be interrupted. So I went back to my draft board, and they said, well, Moffitt, about 11 months from now, you'll be drafted. So I went to NBC, and they said, call us when you get back. And so I was crushed. However, my neighbor uh, was the managing editor 
uh, CBS News. And he said, we don't have this kind of program, but we have a mailroom, that's where we train people. So he got me an interview, and of course with his say so, I got uh, accepted to the CBS New York mailroom. Well, so you uh, have that traditional start of the mailroom. Yes, a lot of people uh, recognize the William Morris Agency as a place to start in their mailroom, but uh, also CBS. A lot of interesting people came out of the CBS mailroom in New York. And what evolved from the mailroom? How did, how, how did the mailroom go for you? I would go to every single office from Bill Paley's on down. I befriended all the assistants, all the secretaries. I would hear about job openings. So that helped me to get my first job out of the mailroom. And what was that first job? Well, there are a couple of things I really didn't want, but I was interested in news at the time. I wanted to be Edward R. Murrow. Okay. So the first opening was in uh, the newsroom, desk assistant. The, the real problem was that at the time, the news department was sustaining. They did not have a program like 60 Minutes. There were very few opportunities. Nobody really moved up. So I turned that down. And um, in, instead, I, uh, I, I, I found that there was a, an opening in operations, network operations, for a night log clerk. Now, a night log clerk, you'd go up into the control center over Grand Central at the time and sit in an announce booth where there was what they called a cord, coordination studio, and everything that, was not, that did not come out of a studio, a stage, would be rolled in from there. Films would be rolled in from there and uh, previously um, recorded programs. At the time, there's no videotape. It was basically 60 millimeter film. So I would sit up there with all the FCC logs, and there was the network log, the local station log, actually two of them, and the announcer. And what did that lead to eventually? Where did you head from there? Well, I really wanted a production assistant job. Okay. And there was a woman named Lillian Curtis, who was sort of the dragon lady of, of of, tel of CBS. She was in charge of all the, 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 the staff directors at the time, the associate directors and production assistants. And so I had, I had an interview with Lillian Curtis early on because I, I was my experience and I, I really wanted a production assistant job. And she was like the Iron Lady and she was a Moffat and said, you're going to have to get five years of Broadway experience before I'll even talk to you. Now Broadway, because everything was live at that time, and they considered the background, not film, not radio, but live. Because if you could do Broadway, supposedly it would be an easy transition into television. My problem was, with I, it was just as hard to get into a Broadway situation, but I started working off-Broadway. And I, I, I worked off-Broadway at Tempo Playhouse where I did lighting and stage managing, and I actually had a few small parts and I decided that was not for me as an actor, but I really loved the, the production work. And so I was at CBS by day after the night log clerk, clerk uh, job. I mm -hmm. moved into operations with teleops and slides, another dull job, but I did that by day. And then I would go off Broadway and I would work there. And then at night we'd go out to eat at two in the morning. I would sleep wherever we could find a place at somebody's pad, sure. we'd sleep on the floor. And then I go back to work the next day. So it was kind of exhausting, but I learned a lot. Now, how did that lead to the Ed Sullivan show? Well, there's a big, there was a big gap. What happened was I was drafted 11 months later. Okay. So I left my little off-Broadway and my operations job, and I went into the Army. And because I worked for CBS, they didn't know any better. They assigned me to the television branch. And I also designed all the sets, and I started directing multi-camera. However, I went back to CBS afterwards, and they said, very good, you're going back in operations. Like, they, it didn't mean anything to them. Jack McGeehan was the associate producer of The Ed Sullivan Show. And Bob Precht had just taken over at 29, The Ed Sullivan Show, and was looking to staff it with people. So he was looking for a production assistant. And I said, oh, Jack, how about me? And he looked at me, and uh, we became friends because I just helped him out a lot. And yes. So he went to Bob Preck, and um, at first he, he said, no, he has no experience. I want, I want the best production assistant at CBS, who is Betty Stein. And so he had interviewed uh, Betty Stein, got Betty Stein, but then they were doing a once a month special, and he said, all right, Betty will do that, but I need another production assistant to work the other three live shows. So um, they interviewed all the other 
PAs and Bob didn't like any of them because he thought they were all they wanted to be is they weren't actors and they were just doing this because Lillian was hiring actors. So I got the job and um, as, a, as the second production assistant on the Ed Sullivan Show. That's one of the many advantages of not wanting to be an actor. That's what I didn't want to do. I would have been the world's worst <laughs> actor. I would have starved to death. I was the second PA, but then the once a month Ed Sullivan See America specials went, after two they just were not picked up. Okay. So Betty Stein went on to other specials and I became the first and only production assistant on the Ed Sullivan Show. And what was that experience like? And uh, what, what, was your, what was your impressions of the show at that time? Well, in those days, it was one of the hot shows on television. It was always in the top ten. It was, a, it was an amazing experience. It was live every week. Why did it do so well? Why did people respond? Because certainly Ed, Ed Sullivan was not a smooth, articulate He was known MC. as the great stone face. He loved that, and he loved people joking about it. He loved all the comics that would come on and do Ed Sullivan. He, nobody appreciated it more, laughed more than Ed. I, he almost crucified me that my first experience with him. Mm. I was, uh, my first job, I was, actually this is when Betty was still there, this was Sea America in Chicago, the second to last one they did. And I was there as a, as a film researcher and coordinator, working with the art director. And we were doing historic films on sl and slides, so Ed would sit there with his glasses down, and he'd look at this, we don't have time for that, and, no, we just don't uh, kill that. And I'm looking at this thing, all this uh, the work that we've done two weeks and all this historic film footage was yes. going out the window. And I kept looking back at, at Grover, and he knew better to say anything because I was brand. He just gets slinking down in his seat little by little, so just his, little, just his eyes <laughs> was sticking up. I didn't know any better. So this one slide came up. So when he was cutting that, I said, oh. All I said was, oh. And Bob Preck leaned forward and said, what, what, John? And I said, well, uh, well, Bob, we put that in to show the, tr the transition, Chicago transition between this, the, the, the fire and the, and the World's Fair. Ed said, how would you like to feel? I said, to give the feeling of that. Ed said to me, how would you like the feeling of a hemorrhage? <laughs> dead silence. I thought, that's it. It's all over. Why did I right. keep I'm my dead. big mouth shut? So anyway, then, then Ed leaned forward. He realized what he'd done to me. And of course, the people from the Wilding Film Studios in the back, they just said, you know. So he leaned forward to me and said, no, John, we just don't have time for that. Anyway, after that, and one other incident that week, after that, Ed just was my champion. Bob and Ed, were, they promoted me from production assistant to associate director to director. But when I was a production assistant, the staff was so small, the production assistant did everything that a unit manager does today. Okay. Everything from getting coffee to scheduling every piece of equipment, all the sets, music clearance. It was amazing what one person could do for $87 a week. <laughs> During the time you were on that show and worked on it, uh, there were some great acts that were uh, still memorable today. Did, were you there when, when the Beatles were on the show? Oh, yes. The Beatles came like a, a storm out of nowhere. Um, we had no idea um, until they arrived how big they were. We just thought, oh, it's another act. And uh, We're booking a popular British act. Uh, yeah. And in any case... They played a little bit in Germany, maybe. <laughs> yeah. And they were in some kind of cave in, uh, in England. Right. But, uh, in, in any case... Um, Ed was very upset that, that they were booked for three performances. I think they got $15,000 for three shows. That, that's what the Beatles were paid? for. First appearance, and Ed, when he... Um, In retrospect, that was a good deal. Well, as, it will, as you find out the next year, so our, our talent booker, Jack Babb, was there and was going every summer. He'd go over to Europe and bring back a lot of acts, and he was telling Ed about this, and Ed was really upset with him. He said, he said Jack... He said, why did you make that deal? No one's going to want to see them three times, and I'm going to have to pay them off. He said, that's a bad deal. Not his words, but that's paraphrasing sure. what he said. Later, Ed would take all the credit for the whole thing. Of course. So now, yes. It's his show. Obviously. And he, his, he's responsible for everything, all the good stuff and not the bad. Right. So now the Beatles come, and all of a sudden, we see the whole side street, 53rd between Broadway and 8th, full of people totally wall-to-wall -to -wall people you can't even get through to get in. So once we got in there, we say, oh my God, 
these people are bigger than we ever thought. And Bob said, before we start, Jim Colley was the director, I was the social director, let's have the cameraman come in and the press. So we let the press in, there were 50, 50 photographers in there, the wall of cameras, and it took a half an hour to do all of that, and then they were gone. And then we actually, the Beatles couldn't be nicer, they were, they showed up on time with their, um, with their instruments, played live, no demands of what they wanted in craft services or anything else, which today is, uh, you know, the, the, the contracts all specify an inordinate number of sure. ridiculous things. So they were great, they were live. Um, so anyway, the Beatles next week were going to be live at the Doville Hotel in Florida, and I went down with the associate producer to set it up. And we met with the, they were gonna be at the Doville Hotel live. So we met with the, the, uh, the police chief of Miami Beach to alert him to what happened in New York. Sure. He was one of those big southern police chiefs that, that's almost a caricature of what they are today. And Jack tried to tell him what happened in New York and what was gonna happen there. And he would say, well, Mr. McGeehan, sir, you have to realize that we really have a fantastic police force down here. We know what we're doing. We know how to handle things like this. Rest assured, no problem. Everything will be under control. <laughs> no, no, chief, you don't understand. Oh, yes, Mr. McGeehan, just relax and rest. Ha. So the Beatles arrive. Word gets out. The kids all know that the Beatles are there. And then we actually um, came to the night of the show. And the police were crazy. They couldn't keep the kids out. They'd get them out. They had the whole force there, I think. So the night of the show, they were up in the, the Beatles were up in the elevator. And they were to come down to the last minute, just before we go on the air. So they come down with the police escort. As they get out of the elevator, the lobby had been cleared. The kids appeared out of nowhere. The now the lobby is full of kids. And the police form a flying wedge to get the Beatles across the lobby to the stage. Meanwhile, so you can actually have Ed a show. is introducing them. And the stage manager is going like this, go to commercial, go to commercial. So Ed went to commercial, the Beatles, right after this. And after the commercial, they made it on stage. And, uh, and so that was the impact of the Beatles. And it was a time that um, it was incredible. I mean, it's just incredible. And it's something that none of us really on the staff realized would be that big until it happened. Yeah, it was astounding. I remember that time, you know, it's one of the times you remember in your life when you see them on TV, and in your case, you were literally there physically as this whole process and chaos was going on. How did that compare to your experience with the Rolling Stones when they followed up? Well, the Rolling Stones had been on, remember I was the production assistant, then I was the associate director, and then the last three years I directed, so I, I vaguely knew them. So when I was directing, finally, the Rolling Stones gonna be on. And I thought, great, I'm gonna direct the Rolling Stones. How great, shoot the Rolling Stones, because you don't tell them what to do, you don't direct them in that sense, but right. I'm shooting them. So now I'm waiting, everything's set up, the camera's ready, I'm, I'm gonna get the Rolling Stones. So we get the word from, uh, from the security gate that they were turned away. And they're, they're leaving. Any, they any, were upset. Any, any reason for that? They were, uh, it wasn't that they were turned away. I think what it was was they didn't know who they were and they were calling and they were so upset that they were getting in the car to leave. I see. I was wearing my gym shoes at the time, much younger, and I went running out of, off the stage, running out to the parking lot, and this is true, I jumped on the hood of their limo. <laughs> and it sort of got their attention. I, I pleaded with them and I said, look, you know, all this time I've been looking forward to really working with you guys, I get to do this, and, and now you're gonna walk away from this. Everybody here loves you, it's not just that one security guard, whatever the problem was, that's not what, that's not what this is all about. Come yeah. on down, come on. Anyway, whatever the hell I said, I have no idea, but the adrenaline was really going. So I- They probably uh, felt sorry for you. I think they did. At that point. So they came down, and they, I, got, I got three numbers with them, and uh, that's, that was the last time they appeared on the Ed Sullivan Show. Well, um, were there other um, acts that were particularly memorable for you that you really f felt were particularly poignant? No, I actually directed the last television appearance of the Supremes. Okay. Diana, Ro Diana Ross was going to leave and um, the, the, the party number was, we'll be together again someday. That was the name of the number and they're all in gold. Yep. 
now I knew Diana Ross and I knew them because as a PA, actually as a PA and as an AD, I had to get lyrics from them. So, so I knew them uh, that pretty well. In any case, obviously I'm thinking as I'm doing this, uh, will they ever get together again? And of course they never did. Right. What happened after the Ed Sullivan show? How did your career evolve after that? What was the transition? Well, when the big ship went down after 23 years, um, the president of CBS at the time didn't give a damn about that. You know, the ratings were down, all over, Ed's old, get rid of him. So they offered him six specials, most of which I did. So in the meanwhile, my income was going down and I was looking for other work. And uh, there wasn't much in, in New York. And then finally, I realized I'm going to have to make the move to the West Coast. So it was a, it was a kind of real tr a transition for me again, because I was well known on the East Coast, but there were no shows. And I was doing commercials, which I hated. We had spent a whole day shooting. And the lighting, it took forever. And then I get to editing. And there we have all the people, from the account executive to client. And, I spent a whole eight hours to make two edits, two dissolves, from the first piece to the middle piece to the end piece. And then the, the, uh, the client would come in and change it. So this was my experience with commercials. I said, I don't want to do that. So I started, I started luckily getting work on the West Coast, and I was commuting. OK. Was this a time that the industry was transitioning to a certain extent from east to west? No, absolutely. Everything was leaving New York. Once upon a time, it was pretty evenly balanced. I guess mm -hmm. it started in New York, really. Then it was evenly balanced. Now everything is going to the West Coast, and I had a commute, which was very difficult. So, um, but I saw the handwriting on the wall, so I, I got out. But now it's like starting over again, because now the, in the West Coast, it's like, who is this guy? You know? Oh, Dead Sullivan Show. Okay. So what was the first kinds of things that you did when you came out to the West Coast? My agent had gotten me a job uh, as producer-director of a, a, a half-hour syndicated show owned by Chevrolet called Stand Up, Johnny Mann, Stand Up and Cheer. Very patriotic. At the end, they'd raise the flag and they'd sing, and they wanted me to come out as a young director-producer and change everything, make it much more youthful, which I tried to do. And it was a half-hour show. It was a pretty steady gig, 26 shows. And everything I tried to do, they thwarted. I tried to change the costumes. I couldn't change the choreography. He was so embedded with them. And he was a good guy. I, I did last on the show, but I wasn't happy with what I was doing. And once I started to get work, um, I, I gracefully bowed out. And I, I was lucky. I then started doing about 10 specials a year, which I love to do. What kind of specials? These were in the heyday of variety. The Perry Como Winter Show, Han okay. Andy Williams Presents, which was an attempt to redo the Ed Sullivan show, right. um, Lily Tomlin's fourth special. Um, uh, they were just a string of them. They just kept going. Now, who would hire you to do these? Would you be hired by the network or by an individual? I had who would become a legendary manager, Bernie Brillstein. And, um, and I had agents, but after a while, I dropped the agents because it was word of mouth. I was getting shows. Once I started, word of mouth, and Bernie and Sandy Wernick would do would, would make the deals. And as you do one, do the other. For example, I did, um, I did the Grand Ole Opry at 50. And Borden was the sponsor. It was a big special, and it was, it was great fun. So Borden's also sponsored the highlights of Ringling Brothers Barnum Bailey Circus every year at NBC. Yes. So evidently, someone, that, Borden's, who was responsible, talked to Urban Feld, who owned Ringling Brothers at the sure. time, and suggested he talk to John Moffat. Well, Urban Feld took that as an order. He set a meeting with me and hired me on the spot to produce and direct his highlight show every year. In any case, he, because of Borden's, and I, I performed for him, and therefore, after Borden's no longer sponsored the show, he kept me on until I formed my own company with Bill Lee, and I, again, had to leave. Now, how did that come about? How did the formation come about, and how did you meet to know Bill? I was, I, uh, among the specials I was doing, I worked with Ron Delsiter on a show called, a special called Good Vibrations in Central Park. Ron Delsiter was a big New York promoter at the time, music promoter. And a guy named Art Greenfield, who was the squarest guy in the world, was the man from his advertising agency that actually got uh, rock and roll in prime time. So he's about to make a deal to sponsor some shows with Dick Clark. And he says, they have their own producer, guy named Bill Lee, but would you direct them? And I said, well, mostly I'm a director here, so yeah. 
So he said, will you meet with him? I said, of course. I couldn't go down there, so Bill calls me, and Bill comes up to meet me in Toronto, where I was editing. During the day, Art would go out to the pool, I'd be editing at night, something else would come up. He's finally, at the end of the week, he says, John, I'm leaving tomorrow. Can we make a deal? You're gonna do it. I said, of course. So now I, am, I have a deal to do the first uh, Dr. Pepper special. It was a half hour called Three Dog Night Night. It was a, it was a wonderful time. And during that time, we, uh, I was getting <clears throat> married again for the second time, short time. Bill and I are with Bernie in the car. And Bernie says, so, oh, hey, kids, uh, you know, if I could put together a deal with you two to go into business, uh, can you do it? A few months later, Bernie says, hey, guys, I got a meeting with you, with, uh, with Tony Thomopoulos at ABC. Okay. We went in for a meeting with Tony Thomopoulos and Lou Ehrlich, and we went out with a two-year development deal at ABC. And the first thing we did was produce the Emmys that year. That was 1978. And then they said, um, we're looking for a late night show. So we put together a show called Fridays, and uh, it went on for two and a half seasons until Ted Koppel came along and sabotaged it unwittingly. And we were making more money than ABC had ever made in late night. Mm -hmm. However, the affiliates hated, they, they hated SNL, by the way, at the beginning, too. That's why I learned how to go on live. And they hated us because of our irreverent humor. So oh. ABC buckled, and rather than lose the show, they said, they liked, they, uh, ABC liked enough, Tony and Lou, they said, we'll give you a primetime pilot. Trouble is, they put it against Dallas. And that was the end of Fridays. Well, uh, you can't fight City Hall sometimes. No. Um, and, and, uh, and years later, Lou Ehrlich said, you know, I just wish we'd bit the bullet and we went put you up against SNL. I wanted to ask you about a couple of people. You, you mentioned Dick Clark. What was it like working with him? How did you find that? Dick was, um, Dick was a mixed bag. He was one of the cheapest people he'd ever worked for. What Dick would do is when you had a budget, he would draw a line and 25% off the top of the budget went to Dick. The rest of it we had to deal with. So we were always underfunded. He had a temper, he would like to micromanage, but the good thing is that when you were in trouble, he was there. We were in Hawaii shooting the Captain into Neil in Hawaii. We had set up Daryl for this um, Encounters of the Third Kind theme in a volcanic setting, and it was wonderful. All of this stuff in the Space Age set, and it's all there. Sure. Of course, outdoors. Starts to pour. Who is the first one to run out and pick up sets? Not a stagehand, not Dick Clark. Dick was out there with everybody hustling, grabbing all the stuff, putting it away. It was an extension of micromanagement, really. Extension, yeah. He was in both, it was good and it was bad. Dick would give, he would give the stage manager a terrible time because he hated the direction, was directors, because we were always delaying things. Sure. Bill was right in the middle because otherwise Dick would have just chewed me up. I understand. You also worked with uh, Dick Van Dyke on Van Dyke and Company. What was that like? He was the most funny stand, uh, fall down, uh, physical comedian. He was as good as anybody in the business. So. Um, uh, we got a series on NBC, uh, Van Dyke and Company, and it was an incredible show. Um, it won the Emmy that year for Best Variety Show and was canceled. And when it won the Emmy, on stage, Bob Einstein was there. We were all there on stage, stage, and he was holding Dick's head like this. He said, see this, America? This is the longest you've seen Dick on NBC this whole season. And he was incredible. He was just the nicest guy to work with. He was really... And to this day, he's Mr. Nice Guy. Now, when did you first uh, start directing the Emmys? Again, it was when I was doing these 10 specials a year, word of mouth, and um, I, somebody at ABC said, you gotta talk to Norman Rosemont, who's producing the Emmys this year. Norman Rosemont was a big presence. He would do these movies based on the classic comics, all these classical things. He was doing that for ABC, and then I guess he'd, he'd sell them as features abroad. So I met with Norman, he liked me, I liked him, and so he hired me to direct the Emmys, 1976. And in, we had some interesting ideas. At that time, we were doing it at the Century City, at, uh, at, at what was the theater there that, uh, that was long since gone. Right. And only one of the towers was occupied, the other was completely empty. So I think it was initially Norman's idea said, let's do, put the Emmy statue in one of them, and the 
eighth annual Emmy Awards than the other. So now I got a helicopter, and I did it from like outer space. And we wrote a theme, and it comes in from outer space, gets closer, closer, like Google. Closer, 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 then dissolved to a helicopter. Helicopter comes from downtown LA, and as it comes around the building, the theme starts, and you see this fantastic shot. For the 28th Annual Emmy Awards, John C. Moffat, ladies and gentlemen. Oh boy, uh, I, in 10 years in the booth, I've never been as nervous, truthfully, as sitting out there tonight. And Bill Crothers, I would gladly change places with. If only you could have this delivered to the booth. I'm the only director that ever won an Emmy for directing the Emmys. <laughs> well, uh, what a nice achievement and what a nice shot. Um, what's the, how do you direct an award show? What, what, what are the particular problems of directing that versus a variety show? Well. Uh, other than an Ed Sullivan show and Dick Clark Live, the shows are pre-taped, most of the specials. Okay. And uh, one good reason for it is you can get the best possible, especially with a singer, you want, like, mm. you want the best possible Excellent. performance, and you want to be able to edit, and uh, everything should be perfect. With uh, the Ward show, it's, it's live, and you don't know what's going to happen to some extent. The, the wonderful thing is when, when the unexpected happens, Somebody does a somersault in the aisle. It's when things like that happen. What you do is, I call it zonal defense. The zonal defense is that you know the awards, you know the cameras that are gonna shoot the, the, the nominees in the audience. Um, the whole show is structured, great deal of preparation because it is live, great deal of preparation. You can prepare everything, the opening, any production numbers you're doing, Make sure that you have the reverse shots from, of all the people coming up on stage. Um, you have multiple cameras, so you know, you, you, you've got coverage going. And then you hope for the best. And the best is that somebody is going to break out and do something wonderful. And that the acceptance speeches will be terrific and not boring. Um, and they'll, be bitter, they'll make bittersweet or very funny remarks. So that uh, that part is out of your control. And if you get lucky, you get a really good show. Now, during about, about that same time, you directed a feature. My partner, Pat Lee, and I were doing a series for HBO at the time, and I got a call from Michael Gruskoff, and a oh, familiar name to me. He produced um, Young Frankenstein, and he had a project, and he wanted to know if I'd be interested in directing it, and of course I said yes. Love at Stake was a satire on the witch trials of the 1640s. And the premise was it was all a scam by the mayor and, um, and the sheriff, I guess, to, um, to seize property by declaring people to be witches, burning them at the stake, and they got their property. And they were going to build high-rise log cabin condos. And they had a model. And it was all log cabins, but they were condos. They were high, you know, several stories high. So, um, in any case, we went to Toronto. That's a very strange premise. It was a strange, the whole thing was a very strange premise. We had an interesting cast. It was uh, Barbara Carrera as, as the witch, but of course, you was so beautiful, she, you, you didn't think she was the witch. At the end, she turns into Anne Ramsey, who was the witch, witchy witch. And um, it, was, uh, it, was, um, it was Kelly Preston as the ingenue, David Cassidy, um, it was Bud Court yes. and Georgia Brown in one of her later roles, um, and who, Dave Thomas, and somebody from not necessarily the news, strangely enough, Sue Pankin. Yep. So um, we were on location in Toronto. Now remember, I put in a year so far. Well, I was used to television, which was fast and immediate, and we would do a show in such fa in a week we would do a show and sometimes we would do a when I did a show like Sammy and Company we do five shows at five half hours a day so it was very um, it, it was very strange to me that so far I put in a year now we were going to be shooting up there for uh, weeks many weeks and I'm thinking well you know uh, how many pages did I have to do a day and they said 
you, you had to shoot two and a half pages a day. Two and a half pages a day? Oh my God, I said, I could do that in an hour. Well, the first week I didn't get two and a half pages done, and the first two weeks, and film finance was gonna come and take over if I didn't watch out. So I all of a sudden realized- The, the bond company coming in, and yes. you were moving too slow, and you were gonna be over budget, right. et cetera, so, et cetera. So I realized then how to do it. But the interesting thing that was really different to me, other than the fact that, it, that everything moved so slowly, uh, that it took uh, a day uh, to do two and a half pages. And I realized that, well, first of all, when I went up there, Michael Gruskopf was there for the first few days. I rehearsed for a couple, three days, and then he left. I said, where are you going? I was the first time feature film director, and he said, well, I'm not interested in the process. That's what I do, and goodbye. Right. Yeah. And I'm a little petrified, and I'm there with my, my unit manager, who is a second generation. His father did um, a Gone with the Wind. He taught me how to really be a film director. But what I realized was that when I was there, everything was in my hands. In television, the producer has a lot of the responsibility. Sure. And these days, particularly, director is a hired hand. The director, once, once the ship sails, you are, every department wants your attention. You have to make every single decision. I learned that every costume, every extra, everything funnels to the director. And I could not believe the responsibility and the time that it consumed. It was an amazing process. And it wasn't over. After we finished shooting, it was another year to edit and re-edit and re-edit and sweeten and, and get it out there. So, uh, and then my manager, Bernie Brillstein, says, so kid, you want a film career? You want to do this? And I said, no, no, I own my shows on television and I can't stand this pace. Three years to do this? I said, well, in three years, I could do two or three different series. So I did not pursue it. Right. I went back to the love of my life now, because I, th I thought it would be feature films, but no, it was television. And, I, and to this day, that's still where I really belong. Now after that, you tended to do more comedy specials than musical variety specials uh, or comedy musical variety specials. We don't see those kinds of shows so much anymore. What has happened there? I mean, there obviously there are the reality shows like uh, American Idol and The Voice and shows like that, but that's a different sort of animal. Why have the variety which featured comedy and music gone away pretty much? One of the reasons, I think, is that um, uh, after that period, there were fewer people who could actually host, run, be the front person on these comedy variety specials. Also, the writing on a lot of them was pretty lame, pretty stilted. The writers had a guest on that maybe they didn't know what to do with, and they had to write this, these lame dialogues and the music, and... the music was the best part because they had really good arrangers, sure. really good. So the music was great, but when it came to doing the actual comedy, the interaction with the stars, um, it got it, it, it was pretty stilted, and I think the audience started to not respond to it anymore, and the variety show died out. Um, for years, it was a dirty word. Variety was a dirty word um, until Saturday Night Live sort of resurrected the format. It was sure. sort of a format. But what happened today is it has come back, but it's splintered. It has dance shows. It has singing shows, American Idol. It has uh, reality shows, uh, comedy shows. But Variety was all in together one entity. Now it's splintered and it's resurfaced and people love the dance shows, Dance mm -hmm. with the Stars, they love the American Idol and The Voice. Um, but I think that the only people that could host and run a variety show today would be Justin Timberlake, who can do everything, and he, he, could, he could do it. Is the form of talent different where they don't have the variety of skills and abilities, or is it just like it always was, do you think? Well, as I said, I think there are very few that have it, like Justin is one. I'm trying, right, I can think of another, but right now I, I can't, but I know there's very few, there's a handful of people actually have the multiple skills to do it. I think that's one big problem. And the other is the lure of when you are that, that multi-talented, right. you go into a film career. Yeah. 
it's a different world, but the biggest, the biggest change is that in the early days, and especially into the early days of Variety, there was one television set, and the whole family had to watch for what they wanted to see. Right. That was the success of the Ed Sullivan Show. You were an opera mom, could watch the opera at the time. Dad could watch the Mets singing, take me out the ball game when they won the World Series. Um, you could watch the, uh, the Rolling Stones. The kids would wait for the Rolling Stones. What Ed always did was they put them on at the beginning, like the Beatles, and then he'd say, they'll be back later in the show, and he'd save them to the last act so that there was good showmanship. But um, that today it's so splintered, not only is it splintered in that everybody has their own set, but they have the multiple devices. Yep. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a new world that does not bode well for variety ever coming back in that old form. Right. Now, you've done a lot of comedy specials since then. Um, one of them was uh, Mr. Show, which has become a cult favorite on DVD and elsewhere. Uh, how, did that, how did Mr. Show become a show? Well, my partner and I, uh, HBO decided to do a comedy festival in Aspen. There was a whole slew of young, talented kids that would do these off-off Broadway, actually it was in the West Coast, so off-off Santa Monica and off-off Beverly, and they would do these little venues and they put together shows and they would perform in each other's shows that, that various teams would write. And uh, one of them was Bob and Bob Odenkirk, David Cross, and they would do live segments. They'd do sort of a, a duologue, the two of them would come out. And then they would go to a video segment and they'd do sketches and back and forth. And it, uh, it was very funny. And so um, we booked them for Aspen for the comedy festival. And we did it in Aspen. And I was sitting with Bernie. And Bernie said, I think I can sell this to HBO. He said, you, but I want somebody experienced to do it. Troy is attached, uh, but I really want, I want you to be there to guide it. So um, our deal was that Troy, because he worked with them, would be the producer and I would be the director. Producers, directors should remember, always be nice to the guy on the way up because someday you may be working for him. Yes. And so now I was working for my discovery, Troy Miller. We had a great relationship. I did the show for four years. Um, it became a, a cult favorite. Um, you also worked with Bill Maher a bit. How was that? Pat Lee and I were doing 16 one-night stands for HBO uh, in South Beach at this great venue. And uh, we had previously spent months going all over the country looking for comedians who could do a half hour, a half hour well. Okay. So anyway, we booked them. One of them was Bill Maher, another was Ellen DeGeneres, and as I said, 14 others. We do the shows. We do it with two audiences. We do two half hours at an early show, break, different audience, do two more the same two performers again. And we go out South Beach and party at night. Or in my case, I'd go out and shoot openings for all 16 shows. It was wonderful. But we established a relationship with Ellen, with Bill, with several other comedians. Sure. So um, Pat and I hired Bill to do a uh, pilot called Say What that we did for CBS. And we did a four-part pilot. So we became friends. So um, when he did his first special on HBO, Pat and I produced it and I directed it. And we've done most of them since then. Um, I did not want to do his weekly show uh, because we had friend. It was a friendship, and uh, sure. I, I didn't want to get that close because it was. And also, we were doing so many other specials for HBO that I didn't want to be tied down to weekly show. Uh, though I love his show, uh, Real Time, but it's not. Uh, it's. I'd love again back to doing specials, but they're all comedy specials. Right, and so that. That tends to be the trend. Um, I recently watched one of your specials, the Jim Jeffries. How, how do you direct someone like that who is so far off the wall? Well, um, Tracy, keep, Morgan, keep them sort of Tracy Morgan was the ultimate problem. Okay. The ultimate problem with Tracy Morgan was that HBO bought him without a show, without him. They bought him on his, uh, because of 30 Rock. And when we went to see him in San Francisco the first time, I was horrified he had no act, all he had was smut and dirty and filthy stuff. Sure. And he said, you all think that I'm the one from 30 Rock. Well, that's not me. This is me. And he thought he was being Bill Maher, and he thought he was being uh, Richard Pryor. He thought he was, this, this what he, well, the difference is Richard Pryor stuff was all very intelligent. Right. And his stuff was really, really raw and bad. So actually, HBO got him a, a, a comedy writer at our insistence, 
and work with him. So over the period of a few months now, his, his hour, and it was a comedy hour, full hour, no commercials, um, got better and better. And the whole thing changed, but we, we were constantly inputting, do this, do not do that, for your own sake. Because you have to be liked in the audience. The audience has to like you and have to want to stay with you. So that was the one extreme. So after that, we got Jim Jeffries. Right. He was not nearly as bad off. His whole thing was he was raw. And it was, he had a lot of material. And the question is editing. I was never really a writer, but I was an editor. So we would edit. This, do this, don't do that, move this around. And that's how Pat and I honed. When you say editing, uh, editing beforehand and before he did the show, shaping what, what shaping. He was do I it. should say it's shaping, editing his material, shaping his material Got exactly. It. Okay. So that's what we did, and yet we did not want to destroy his voice. Yeah. I mean, he had definitely an unusual, unique voice, yeah. and underneath that brash, you know, um, barroom exterior, it's a really sweet guy. Well, you can kind of tell that. It comes through. He's so vulnerable. What yeah. he puts on himself, you feel for him. Yes, you do. Yeah. And that was important. That we made sure that was toward the end that he really, that you really have to sit feeling, uh, this poor guy, he means well. He's a, he's a sweetheart. Well, the work that these people do as comedians and the work that you do in shaping that is so impressive because comedy is really hard. To do yes, dying is easy. Comedy is uh, difficult. Exactly, Some, something like that. Now you served. You've served for many years as a uh, member of the board of governors of the Television Academy. Yeah. Uh, how did that come about, and what has that consisted of? What 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 work do you do as as a uh, as a governor? Well, uh, early on, I only knew about the academy by directing. Uh, the, the Emmy Awards and producing them in, in 80, uh, 79 and 89. Um, years later, like 12 years ago, or maybe a little bit longer, Lee Miller called me, who was a governor, a good friend of mine, and we've worked together on the mm -hmm. specials. Lee called and said, we have a problem with comedy variety, um, and I need your help. Will you run for governor? Because I, I need another strong voice here. And I ran. Uh, one reason I read was my wife Donna found out that every year that they would have this great, um, they would be all, they'd be invited down to uh, Orlando. She said, oh, that's great, you should Terrific. join, you should join because that's a great trip, all paid for. So I, between the two, I said, okay, I'm going to run. So of course what happened was that was the last year they did that. And to this day I'm still mad at Lee that got me into this. And it was I a never bait got, and switch. I never got that great trip. Anyway, what the problem was that the Academy at one point, because comedy variety was so splintered and went away, that they combined comedy variety specials and comedy musical variety series into one. And the director of, a, of the Jay Leno show could never compete with Don Mischer because they were in the same category. And one was a big budget special and the other was a weekly show. Mm -hmm. So we managed to actually turn the Academy around and reestablish that award separately. So now there's a directing award for comedy variety music series, comedy music specials. And I found I really got involved with the Academy and um, I was put in charge of the Creative Arts Awards. And then the last few years I was put in charge of um, Representing the Academy at the primetime show, I was chair and then co-chair, I needed help, uh, of the show committee, and we had a lot of input, and we initiated getting the backstage cameras as a second screen, which now has become a big thing. If you were to uh, give some thoughts and advice to someone who wanted to do some of the same things you've done, what, what would you say to someone who is starting out or perhaps in the early stages of their career? What, what, what guides might you give them? Well, I think the first thing is that it's one of the so-called glamour professions. Um, and I think that people tend to want to get into it because of what they see, not what they really know about what you have to do to get in and what the job really is. It's not just surface, it's really, really, really hard work and perseverance. The first thing I think is you have to decide you don't want to do anything else. This is what I want to do. 
Um, the worst part is for acting because the actors have a terrible, terrible job to, to actually survive all the, the terrible rejection that you go to through. To find the work. Yes. Uh, no matter how big you get, you can have right. a bad film or a bad television show and all of a sudden you can't work. The next thing you should do, if you have a creative talent, something that I could not do when I was starting out, you have the tools to do it now. You can go out and buy a little camera for nothing. Get your mom and dad to do that. Write a script. You can do it yourself, like my grandson has done. And you can get it on YouTube, and you can get discovered. You can do things today, and I'd say it's up to you. You can't sit around and say, I'm going to wait for a break, and I'm going to wait, I'm going to go to film school. Forget film school right now. Film school is great for contacts. But for you to get out there, whatever age, you can start when you're seven years old, eight, nine, ten, months, whatever, you've got to get out and do it and prove that you can do it and prove to yourself that you have the talent and the resi resilience and the perseverance to actually do it. And now you have something to show. John, thank you very much for taking this time. Uh, I've really enjoyed this conversation. You're welcome. Thank you so much for having me.